Welcome to Beyond. Welcome to Beyond Bars. That's what I'll do. Welcome to Beyond Bars, a quote unquote justice impact podcast hosted by myself. I am Catherine Gongaway, and this is Kyrie Johnson. Kyrie Johnson. And here at Beyond Bars, we love to make sure that we can start to humanize some of our brothers and sisters going through the struggle uh, by adding some. Uh, context to everything and make sure they have a platform to talk about their stories their why right yeah we don't really know what this is yet we're just sharing stories we're giving people the opportunity to share experience mm-hmm. and um shed as we would say like some light on conversations that typically live in the dark and behind closed doors and that people are not necessarily willing to share and talk about so uh our guest today mm-hmm. the one and only felonious monk can we get a wide and wide and everything oh that you God! deserve in Don't post, y'all he is a writer, an actor, a comedian. Uh, I would an activist. Would you consider yourself? Sure. Cool. Let's do that. Um, cool. And just a, a prominent figure. I think that we both look up to, both in the scene and as people. So we're so happy to have you here today, Felonius. Thank you for being with us on Beyond Bars. I'm gonna be honest with you. I thought this was a freestyle rap podcast. <laughs> That's very fair. And I was gonna <laughs> spit some of my bars and then explain. <laughs> the the meaning beyond the bars, but I guess we could do the thing y'all are doing. We can too. get a beat. That's cool. Should we? That's can we get a beat? <laughs> That's I, cool. I guess. We I would could prefer do, that opening. We could line. do your thing. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> oh no! This is such a cool concept, man. I like I like that. Um, I like that someone is doing this. I like specifically that you're doing this, Catherine. I'm, I'm hoping that this helps you. Uh, it's healing. It feels very much like scared straight for you, but welcome. You know, so Catherine's doing. Why the, is it? Ca- why is it scared straight for me? I was just, hey man, I'm just. I don't know. It feels like the right thing to say. In case we do cut out the intro, this is scared straight because Kyrie <laughs> remains on Snapchat. <laughs> He remains on Snapchat. He will get picked up for it. I cannot believe that this is the theme of the show. Get up oh, man. For it. Have a seat. I think it's an important <laughs> part of this conversation. It's not Chris Hansen of Dick Pitt. We're here talking oh. about rehabilitative work and restorative justice, mm-hmm. and you have some of it to do, I think. You got some work to do, man. You got How some. Do you, you I'll send you a list. We're calling you in. You can't just put the devil <laughs> on somebody like yeah. that. You know? I don't we're think we're, I don't think, we're calling you in. I don't think we're, we're you into this putting work. the devil on you. I think it's uh, I think it's the filter that you're putting on your dick before oh. you Snapchat it. God, um, we love having comedians here. It's the worst. It's the it is writing the worst. for me. It's, it's the worst. It's the filter. <laughs> Being with somebody close friends means you're open to... No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It means we're close friends, dog. It does not mean I want to see your dick. I tell you that. Let me just clear that up. Now, if we're on Instagram not- and I'm in your close friends, I do expect to see occasional ratchetness. I want to see you knock somebody the fuck out, shake a little ass, twerk something. I'm not making that gender. Whoever, throw it. Throw that ass in a circle, sir or ma'am or they. I don't care. But if we're on Snapchat and your dick pops up, no. when I see you, there's going to be some motherfucking problems. That's just who I am as a person, though. But I mean, <laughs> what, yeah, just, where's must, the room for people with, with, with really big fingers, small nope. screens? No. There's like... Edit don't, the edit function don't put exists. really big fingers into this opening the podcast. Is I don't think this gross. is working for us at all. Yuck. This is this Yuck. is fair. Ugh. really big Ugh. fingers and small screen. I don't even want it. Pervy Sage. You Yuck. are the Jiraiya of podcasting. <laughs> that is I don't, that is just for I me. I don't know how this happened. That's for, that's for us. That I was came to talk about rehabilitation. You can. And, and create keep your, change. We're keep talking your about big it. fingers and out of it. Here we are talking about it. We're talking about personal experience. Wow. We're talking about um, what? Do, what do we just say? Wow. Regret, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> resurrection, yeah. redemption. Yeah, I'll be honest. It I was here to like share my story, but I, I think we need to talk about you. Yeah, should I just switch sides? Should I just yeah, pull we should all, slide over here. all the way over here? Because <laughs> your hands are, you look dusty. I'm trying to do something to like convince you not to go. What do we need to do? Um, okay. I, I, I just feel like I'm misunderstood. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's what like I told you. Like I'm fighting for my life. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. Your honor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not who this video <laughs> presents me as. I can tell you I've written oh. many a character letter and <laughs> I'm misunderstood is not, <laughs> not, not, not part of it. It's not gonna go. It's not gonna help, dog. It's not going anywhere. I, I don't know how I could ever come back from this now. We spent a great chunk of time talking about something that I 
didn't even have on my bingo card for the day. Well, to be fair, if you burn the phoenix to the ashes, it still rises. So you have a shot, but you probably want to stop yeah. the dick picking now. Everybody like, loves a comeback. Mace, yeah. we already, mm. we've been there. Mm. Everybody loves a comeback. So, um, Kyrie, you just, you know, you pay your penance however you need to. We're not interested in what yeah. that. Yeah, that's your, that's your personal, that's your shadow work. You should. You my should shadow that. work is the next. Wow, yeah. Felonia's yeah. coming with shadow yeah. work. Speaking of my language. Go to therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking yeah. Of my, yeah, you really Maybe could sub in for me. I'd take the app off my phone if I were. It's just something <laughs> that, just to consider, something to consider, like, we make could, a boundary for you. We could watch him. Do it. We could. We I, could help. I already did. We could be a I'm when, taking the steps. I'm not taking your word for it. Yeah, I did. Not. And I don't I, mean that in a way to say that you're not trustworthy. I mean to say that I don't trust you. That's not the same thing. <laughs> that literally is the same thing. You no. just use different words. No, no, you literally no. said, I don't trust you. That don't mean that I don't trust you. What no, 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 no. I'm saying you could be a trustworthy person, but you have done things that make me feel like I shouldn't trust you. In this moment. In, in this time. moment. Yeah. yeah. So, Okay, I'm glad we started that conversation. I said something on another podcast about exactly that, but it was talking about people getting in relationships and circling back, right? Mm, And I was basically right, and I was like, "Hey, like a positive way or backslide?" No, like you go, yeah, backslide when you go hit something. See, that's the thing. That's the conversation that we're having, right? Is is the um, if someone if someone did something to you and made you feel horrible, and then they got themselves together. They yeah. became a better person and they came back to you. Mm. Do you owe them immediate forgiveness, right? Because this, all the harm they've done to you mm. isn't undone by however much good they've done in the world since then. Mm. And I'm saying that not only do that, does that apply to relationships, but that applies to ex-offenders sometimes. Where we have to acknowledge that even though we've come home and, and we haven't been recidivist and we've become family men and, and raised our kids and done all of these things in the environment, the person or the people that we harmed don't owe us the same lens that we're being seen through by everyone else. So, mm-hmm. it, like, it's it's interesting. Like, I'll come to a podcast. Well, oh, this felonious monk, he's the he's a this thing and a that thing because that's where you met me. You met me here already. Mm-hmm. You didn't meet me when this wasn't a fake eight ball jacket because it was I was wearing it because it's funny. I, it was a real eight ball jacket and the pockets were full of coke and guns and, and whatever. And so the people who knew me then, they don't see me on TV and go, oh, I'm so proud of him. Yep. He's turned his life around. They look at me and go. Mm. So I'm saying mm. I'm still as trustworthy as my kids think I am, as my coworkers think I am, as my partner thinks I am. But the people who see me, who I've harmed, don't have to hold that space for me. And they don't ever have to. Like, they don't have to change, well, how, how much do you want him to pay? It doesn't fucking matter, all of it. He, I, don't, I haven't gotten over the hurt, so I don't have to forgive him yet. And that's the toughest part to me about being an ex-offender is there isn't anything that I can do to undo that harm. They can choose to forgive me or not choose to forgive me. I can't hold that against them either way. What I did to them, they didn't ask for. That's hard. That's a hard, that's a every night you have to, I'm giving it all back to you. I'm sorry again. And some days you don't feel good. No matter how much good you've done, you don't feel like a good person. You don't sure. feel trustworthy, even if I can trust you. And that's so, you know, stop showing your dick, but you're a good person. <laughs> Why? Why would you ruin such a great clip? Because you think that ruined, ruined it? Ruined it? Wow. That, we'll post that. We'll post <laughs> that, that whole it, three minute clip. Don't fucking think I won't. Really I think that made it more poignant actually. because it was a, a the specificity. The I also ready to have a good conversation, a really deep conversation. You didn't think that's what we were having? Points. That is. That that's is not. That is, and also, fully to your point, like I mean, that's such a human feeling, mm. right? In general, I mean, as you were talking about that, I was thinking about like ex relationships, right. whether it's friends, romantic relationships, oh. whatever. Like we're constantly. One of the tenets of yoga, like the first tenet, mm-hmm. right, is non-harming. It right. is non-harming. And when I'm teaching, I'm always talking about doing less harm mm. because we are constantly harming. Mm. We're constantly harming all the time, whether it's the earth that we're walking yeah. on or each other. And there's, it's so much more difficult to make peace with that, I mm-hmm. think, as humans. It, it, it's much easier to walk around, especially as, like, yogis walking around. Like, we are non-harming. Like, mm. we're vegan. We don't, right. eh, whatever. But we're still harming. Yeah. And that's a tough thing to settle down with at the end of the night and be like, yeah, like I have, I have done harm. Like when I think we all have, right? Like there's degrees of it for sure. Right. But that's such an interesting. I don't. I, and the, the idea of harm reduction 
feels like first steps, but also it feels like it's um it's a mandatory place to be, right? Like I do think that there's a, the idea that as human beings we're going to harm. Part of that comes from how we frame our relationships, right? There's something that you can do that's innocuous. It you mean no harm. It really is up to me that I took harm from it, but I'm holding that against you. Right. You slighted me some way. I walked by you one day. I said, hey, man, you didn't say hi back. You didn't hear me, but I'm holding you. I'm holding you accountable for how I felt. You harmed me. It doesn't matter that that's not really what happened. That's my reality. Mm. And so that's when it gets this really live comedy right now. Right. This too. is how my right. stand up looks. <laughs> but that's <laughs> how. But it is. People, so there is a degree of people walking in to say, like, I'm here to be harmed. Like, right. You feel that. From, you, this is yeah. the crowd work. Oh, my gosh. The crowd work clips are my favorite part. Please make fun of me. And I'm like, I would rather tell you this joke about Kyrie's yeah. dick. And no, that's the name of this part. It's Beyond Snatch the Bars I- is where you find <laughs> Kyrie's dick. I'm trying to make a really positive podcast for the community. Are you saying your dick is negative? <laughs> wow. I'm saying that there's so many things to look at. We didn't have to look at that. That's what the ladies were well, saying when you Snapchatted well, that dick. Well, well, well. That's exactly no what they were saying. No one in the rooms received one. This we're the a- only room. This is like ground zero of the, we're the literal only. If we walk outside that door, it's just phones full of your dick. It's behind the, the curtain. Behind the curtain. It's like 30 se- You know what? I think it's time. Open the curtain up. Those are all people you've harmed with your dick picture. I'm sorry. It's not a... Sorry, y'all. This is a very serious matter. The people discussing. that send out the political text messages. Yeah. That's, that's them. They're like, yo, do you want to vote? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Vote for this meat. See? Well, you see? Polonius, when? Brandon Johnson. I thought you might be coming in here to replace me as a podcast host. Oh, no. Mm-mm. But when Kyrie eventually is removed. Re- force, forcibly removed. <laughs> likely in cuffs. <laughs> likely. Will you come host this podcast I, me? I will. I have experience with the system. I can teach you how to navigate it. You want to get some money on your books quickly. Yeah. You're going to want to have you money yo- for I'll first canteen. Yoga. I'll be there to help you write stories. I, um... It's fine. It's a thing I do. Uh, <laughs> I want to eventually get representation. I'm never going to. You get are going to need counsel. Shit. I can say that. I don't know. That's if the type that's of the, We do have defense yeah. attorneys coming on this pod all the time. Attorneys, I've got some numbers for you. Yeah. How did this turn into a damn Chris Hansen? Hey, man. I don't look, man. We just take the the route that's given to us. We don't make the roads. We drive on the ones that are there, and. um you put your dick out there, dog. Right. That's, that's where we. <laughs> you been to prison? No. You been to jail? No. That's good. Yeah. You uh, you ever broke the law? Of course. Statute of limitations. I don't want to say anything yeah. specific, but for sure, for sure, see you have. I think, to be honest with you, for long, I think most people have. Mm. I think uh, that that's why like the the numbers are so disparaging, right? Because we know in the back of our minds that anybody who says, "Hey, I haven't been." to prison, I haven't been to jail, mm-hmm. I haven't been, you know what I'm saying, incarcerated, or say I've never been detained, and say all anything, whatever it may be, mm-hmm. uh, it's because of the grace of God. It's because it's because of chance. It's because of luck. It's because of a system that is bu- not, yeah. not targeting it's, you. Well, but I, mean, I assure you, you at some point did something that was not legal. <laughs> it might have been light, right? You was probably on yeah. LimeWire downloading porn. Or I don't think that's light. How I was do we? Why do right we keep getting back to porn? You walk yourself right man. back into you it. I did not. I, you did that, Dicky Smalls. Anything what are you doing? Like, Dicky Smalls is crazy. Smalls, you, <laughs> Dicky Smalls <laughs> is egregious. <laughs> That's crazy, Dicky Bobby. <laughs> now you see. Okay. Um, Ooh, we got the little got the Amber. Little, the magic oh. man. Uh, <laughs> That's what you do on Snapchat. You know, this is a magic dick. Now you see me in 24 hours, you won't. That's God, crazy. You could have named crazy. any other petty crime. That's any crazy. other. Crazy. He's like, nah, lime wire and porn. You need to know I have a problem. Wow. I like to, that I like is to think crazy, I Crazy, Kirk Franklin. What is happening? <laughs> you wow. said Doc Franklin? What did you say? Doc <laughs> is Franklin. Is that good? Jesus Christ. No, I'm. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I can't asked. make fun of the man that made stomp. <laughs> this man 
man, by the way, on the way into the room, he's like, the news today, P. Diddy did it. So, <laughs> did he did yeah, it? Did he, yeah. did he did it? He did it. <laughs> Kyrie was there. So. Dead in the middle the of Italy, Italy did it. I was there in yeah. spirit. I wasn't actually he there. He did it. He did. You weren't? <laughs> Me think about the protest. That's actually a wild <laughs> place to say that you're there in spirit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> No, y'all going to Diddy Mansion? Ah, oh, I'm at the miss this one, but I'll be there in spirit, butt naked with a jerk. What? That's the freakiest what? show I've with ever seen. With a headband and a shiny suit, just all of shaking in the driveway. What's Why wrong? Is your fucking soul so freaky? That's nasty. That's disgusting. I, <laughs> I asked if you had been because you know statistically there are two of us in the room the likelihood that you had been was actually so I've been detained you right. know what I'm saying stuff like that well, you, you know, know what my I... 72 hours whatever whatever but I've never actually had no charges brought up etc so that's good but that so in in 2014 2012 2012 Trayvon Martin was shot right uh, fast forward 2014 Mike Brown shot fast forward 2020 um uh, George um, Floyd. Floyd is is choked, and 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 in between there were multiple others. A man selling loose cigarettes, another guy Senator chased. Bland, by. Exactly, There's so much exactly, happening, yeah. right? And I made the cops chase me back in. I made them. I was like, they and were like, pull 91. over. This is ninety two, January ninety two. I made them chase before me before Rodney King, right? This before this is before Rodney King, and this is in Virginia. I was going to Norfolk State, so watching that footage of. Trayvon, Tamir Rice, Mike Brown, like back to back to back. You said lucky. And it hit me as much as prison is never lucky, right? And I did all of the time that I could have done. I, if I had maybe gotten to one more fight, I could have done more time. But I did, like, I got turned down for parole all the times. Uh, and then finally I maxed out with good time. But I watched all of these videos as a person who had been Tamir, Mike Brown, I, I had been on the run from cops and had done considerably less or, or considerably more resisting. Watching them not resist and that be the outcome, when I made the cops chase me through two cities in a car, I jumped out of the car after they chased me in the car, took my jacket and shirt off and ran some more, jumped three fences. People in the neighborhood were trying to help by blocking it. Oh, what? He went that way. He went that way. And then they finally caught me. And the worst they did was put a knee in my back, not on my neck. They didn't hit me, kick me. The worst pain I felt was when they landed the first knee on my back. That hurt. But they didn't do anything more than that. They cuffed me. They frisked me. And they took me to jail. And watching the last decade of how police have handled unarmed men, period, but unarmed black men specifically and unarmed black youth specifically, because I was 19 at the time. Mm. It's terrifying because I'm like, shit, I was lucky to have gotten arrested in the 90s. That sounds fucking crazy to say. So it's not just luck. There are systems that are in place I happen to get arrested in between egregious times, right? The, it, if this happens in the 60s, I'm dead. 70s, probably dead. 80s, less likely. 90s, I'm okay. 2000s, I'm probably okay. But once, once, sound, 20, once 2001, stuff. 2002 yeah. is gone, I got this beard. They're like, your name is Arif. That sounds very Muslim-y. <laughs> so there have been times where it was safer to get arrested <laughs> than it is now. This is probably the least safe time to be arrested and that's terrifying so th there's a bit of luck but there's also something systemic about it and, and it's global it's more than just what's happening in your neighborhood it's more than just a cop city in atlanta right it's watching what's happening in in gaza and saying wow the whole world can watch this happen and there's debate about whether or not it's wrong and that says to me that if you don't like a group of people enough they can do whatever they want to you so now I go back and I think what happened between the time I got arrested and the time Mike Brown got arrested or, or didn't get arrested, right? And then you go, oh, oh. shit, Obama got yeah. elected. And the pushback starts there. It started before then, but it's, it really starts there where people go, see, they're getting too big. They're doing too much. They think they're equal. And so now you got a whole decade of just fucking shooting black people. Pushback. That's just crazy to me that we're not putting together that this is 
we're talking about cop city in Atlanta, but we're not talking about a cop city that's going to be built right outside of Chicago or the one that's being built in Utah or the one that's being built in New Mexico or California. This is a normalization of how normalization. we're going to be abused going forward. And so the people who've been incarcerated, who know what all of this looks like, who know that somehow the cafeterias in schools are more closely aligned with the cafeterias in prison than they oh, yeah. are the cafeterias in your job. Same That's contractors for the crazy. food, actually. It's the, the same, same people that provide the food for your, your babies provide the, the trades same. The trades look yeah. the same. The food, the meals look the same. The mystery meat is the same. The difference is the kids might get actual pizza one day, but for the rest of the time, the food is damn near exactly the same. And I worked in the kitchen at one point, and I was like, this is not really food. You guys know that, right? This isn't edible. Um, so it, we, I watched all of that happen and I happen to be too old to really have as much fight. That's, but that's why I go to the gym. Like I'm literally in the gym. Like I might have to whip one or two more asses for this is over with. <laughs> Just in case I'm gonna make sure these guns still fire. Well, revolution the, you know. won't be televised. Brother. And, well, you know, what's crazy about this. I love that song, by the way, I was going to remake it early in my career. I was like, oh, I'm gonna do a funny version of it. It's going to be the, the revolution the will not be on the internet. And it was going to be, yeah, it was going to be like the revolution will not be YouTube. And it was going to be crazy. Yeah. And then I kept watching interviews with Gil Scott Heron about the song. Mm. And he kept saying, you know, it wasn't so much that the revolution was going to be a shock and that nobody would catch it on camera. It was that the revolution had to start here. Mm. The revolution wouldn't be a group of people. It wouldn't be a, a, an organization. It wouldn't be SNCC or Snack or whoever your, or, you know, was gonna be um, the Black Panthers or it's not gonna be Black Lives Matter. It's not gonna be Sean King. <laughs> it's not gonna be That's any of hilarious. these people. Yeah. It's going to have to start here. And the start is when you realize that everything that you've been taught from the day you were born until you get out of high school is designed to either send you to prison or make you a good worker. Those are the only two things. Every creative knows this and they feel it when they go home and their parents say, oh, you still in the circus? Mm -hmm. Hey, you still telling your little jokes? You still crossing your legs up? <laughs> what you do? You stretching? You out there stretching? Is that a job? Because Shit, I'm we've triggered. been programmed yeah. to believe that the only valuable jobs, now your mom and daddy watch TV. Every single one of them watches TV and listens to the radio, but they don't value you doing a thing that might get you on TV or on the radio. Yeah, to make that your work. Yeah. That's prison. That's yes. pr these mm. these that's a, a prison is something that limits your mobility, it limits your ability to move around freely. If you can't pick your own job, if you can't pick your own way of life, if you can't pick how you're going to earn money, even though that's the thing that makes your soul on fire. That's something we don't talk. We talk about, oh, it's going to make me this. Much. What does it what makes your soul feel on fire? Mm. And after you've sat in a cell for six years, if the only thing that you're trying to do is not go back to the cell, the prison really worked. Because it, it kept you. you from thinking beyond anything other than this very narrow idea of what safe is. Mm -hmm. The opposite happened to me. The opposite was, I don't want to be locked up in any way. I can't be incarcerated in any way. If, if I have to struggle to tell jokes, then I'll struggle to tell jokes. But I won't, I won't go to an office for 60, 70 hours a week because it makes everybody else happy if I'm fucking miserable. And very recently, my daughter... That was the harder part. My daughter, who's 19, um, I started doing comedy when she was already six, seven years old. And that means I had to move away from her. And the same way I talk about my son being my, my bestie, that's my butt. My daughter was my first bestie. Like my first really, I don't have, there's no beef we're going to ever have that's going to make you not be my friend. There's no condition. There's, you know what I mean? Like, there was, oh, unconditional love. I didn't know what that meant. And then she was born. I'm like, oh, she could kill 30,000 people right now. And I'd vote for her again. Mm. Right. So that political love. Right. That that, that that blue vote blue no matter who love. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They're still in our job. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> never invite me. It's not even going to be up to you guys. You're gonna, oh, we're going to have Felonious Monk again. Spawn's going to be like, or <laughs> hold on. We'll give you $10 million. Just don't bring that <laughs> money. No, I mean, we honestly, we talked about that, not to interrupt you, we talked yeah. about that briefly a couple episodes ago, uh, just the dynamic that, like, blood is blood, right, and mm. love is love, and a lot of the, like, I, I would argue that the, the majority of crime in this country is economically based, but mm. the, the the subset, vast majority. Yeah, yeah, the subset that's not that, it's which love is, based. Is, is, yeah, it's still economically based, but yeah. it's protection, right, it's, it's protection of it's me protection. and mine, and anyone, I think, anywhere feels that, and at least any parent, I'm not a parent, uh, you know, but, like, 
there yeah. are there are people that I would step in front of, right, and right. go to jail for. And well, so that's the <laughs> that's the wild thing about freedom because it it's so much more than it's so much more than the ability to go where you want to go and do what you want to do. It's also the ability to think what you want to think without worrying about how you're received or yeah. perceived at that point. And I was terrified when I started doing comedy because it took me away from my daughter and she was still so young, I didn't want her to think that I was going away from her. I wanted her to understand that I was, and very slowly I planted seeds for the last decade plus, hey, I love you, I'm doing this so that you can see that there's another path. I don't want you, I don't ever want you to think that there's a version of you that I won't accept. So I am letting everybody in the world fucking hate me or think that I'm crazy so that you can see that I'll survive that. And that was the hardest part because I didn't know if she was going to get it. And maybe she's she young. Right. And maybe a month ago she texted me and said, um, I'm, I'm going to read it because I don't want to fuck it up. But no, it's not it, um, this. Yeah. it was probably the. It was probably the best. um text that I could get because it explained probably some validation it, it was very like. much validation you said that was like 10 years dog so you know yeah, when, you, man. when you touch roll like that you really are you're betting well, and that's 10 years of comedy which is so up down in between it's so oh, much it's God. so much perseverance and discipline to say like you said day in and out uh kids or no kids but I mean even I can't even imagine that extra layer like to say I'm gonna this is yeah. me. This is like what I have to do. This is inside people all the time. Actually, guys in jail this week were like, "Why comedy?" And I was like, "I, I always joke. I'm like, you know, mental illness, which is a degree <laughs> of truth, right? Yeah, yeah. shout out mental illness, right? But it's like it's it's in you. It's in shout you or it's out. not in you. And yeah. if you don't find like you said that source or whatever that is in you and lead it to something like that's like a basic tenet of abolition too is like that creativity yep. is the foundation of revolution because if you don't start thinking outside and you don't start moving Absolutely. outside and once you do start moving outside it like becomes a lot clearer that the box is like not mm. like you, you can't you can't be there you can't anymore. go back in it yeah you can't, you can't in go it in it and so the short version of what happened the day that i'm talking about roy wood jr who um shout out to roy who's done way more for my career and just little bites he just every now and then he'll just That's reach out and go hey here's a thing though. here's a thing when he was writing the pilot for um his show jefferson po he reached out to me one day and said hey man what are you doing this weekend or like next monday i'm gonna fly you out to la put you up in a hotel i want you to punch up my pilot that's love it's my pr first paid writing gig Hell we yeah. had never worked together before he, we didn't have an established relationship we had, he just reached out flew me out made sure i got paid the next time he reached out um, we were just talking about comedy and one day I was like, hey, I think I want to do my special. Let me see if Roy will do like a Roy Wood Jr. presents Felonious Monk. We have a similar type of audience and hopefully this will help. I reached out and he was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. You don't need my name on it. I will produce it and we'll walk it in the studios together. Damn. But check your email because I had sent you something earlier today. What he had sent me was his script for the um, White House Correspondence Dinner. And he was like, I'll pay you an amount of money to write jokes for it. I was like, the fuck is happening? So my, so this is my second thing that he's just given me, um, a bunch of money to do a thing that's gonna help my career. There's no loss for me. There's not even a risk reward to discuss. It's all reward, no risk, because I don't even have to say the jokes. If the jokes don't work, he just doesn't do them in the show, it's fine. But I've already got a check. Third thing he did was he took me on the road with him to do stadium, uh, um, theaters and I I had done theaters but I'd only done theaters in front of musicians before and you know thank you to them because it's still an experience but their audiences don't necessarily come to see stand up. stand up so when I performed with Roy the re the response from the audience was overwhelming and and to the extent that um one night I was recording my set on my phone and the ovation at the end was so long I couldn't in, I could not get to the point where I was supposed to bring Roy on. I had to wait for it. And I like I got him I legitimately got emotional cuz we I'm over a decade in and and there are a lot of nights where you go out and there's three fucking people in the audience and you're on the road and you drove your own car or you rented a car or you flew in and paid for your own hotel and you walk out with $72 on a show you were hoping to get 800 for and Jesus and Christ. 
you keep getting you keep getting up and doing it and you start to think am i stupid as shit i'm stupid i am stupid <laughs> so that night i got that ovation that's my mantra this week actually. i sent it to my daughter <laughs> In the middle of the night, just text her to say, hey, this is what they thought of your dad. And she said, I just cried at this. This hit different. I don't know if it's my age that I can realize how much of a huge deal it is or if, if simply it's a huge fucking deal. I know this felt incredibly amazing, validating, freeing, all of the things. You're the best role model I could ask for. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I responded that, you know, that really meant a lot to me because I questioned whether I made the right decision. And then she said this, and this is why I know as much as she's my daughter, she's her own human being and she's so much better at it than, than me or her mom ever been. She goes, it was always the right choice because it was your choice. You show mm. me more about life and who I am than the people who live close to me. You've given me a family, a real one. La, that's my wife, has been one of the most surprising and vital blessings. When I tell you there's nothing I love more than that little boy, he doesn't. So this is just like my daughter telling me. You're the one who showed me their strength and vulnerability and authenticity. So, yeah, you were in another state, but man, oh, man, have you been right next to me my entire life? This woman's 19. She's a 19 year old. That's amazing. Right. It's a, yeah, right I'll, that, vote, I'll vote for her, too. Can I'd vote her for her, office right. Today? I say all of that to say that you can't control the outcomes, but you can control the work. And if you if you just do the work, this might never happen for you. But it definitely won't happen if you don't do the work. And she reminded me that I made choices that were good choices for me. My child reminded me that the choices that I made were the choices that I needed to make. Mm -hmm. They weren't for anyone else. It wasn't even for her, even though she benefited from it. But that's the tough part about being an artist. Like you, Mm -hmm. You have to make these choices. And I made it because I could not make the other choice. I couldn't be locked up anymore. I couldn't be incarcerated. Physically, I couldn't be incarcerated. My ideas couldn't be incarcerated. When I divorced her mom, that was part of the, I literally said to her mom, I did six years in prison. I refused to be locked up ever again. And, you know, that wasn't a knock on her mom. It was just, I felt constricted. Not being married, that particular marriage wasn't a good one for the two of us. We were both unhappy. Now, 20 years later, we're both like, ah, yeah, that makes sense. Right? But, at the time, everybody's feelings are hurt. It's a lot of fuck you then, fuck you. She ain't do nothing wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just wasn't the right thing. And we have to be brave enough to say, this isn't the right thing for me. This doesn't serve me. This doesn't make me happy. I go home every night with less of me than I left the house with. Mm. I quit. I don't want to do that anymore. I'd rather be a little uncomfortable. And that's the hard part because people would rather be comfortable and very miserable than a little uncomfortable but very happy Mm. and and that's a tough i mean i don't know how to tell people to go out there and be broke because that's what it's going to be a lot of being broke yeah it's not fun it's it's not fun at all but but i think you you touched it's kind of it's not fun but it's it's kind of a necessary fun to i mean there's there's so much value in saying like yeah maybe i can't like fly out to that event maybe i can't you know afford this like group of I don't know, friend dinner. Maybe I can't afford like dinner today. <laughs> like, right, maybe I can't, maybe afford, I can't afford whatever <laughs> it is. But but yeah, mm. to get up and whether it's like I only came because y'all buying me dinner. <laughs> and we are. That's <laughs> one meal I don't have to. That's one less bell to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm inviting so on the way, but yeah, yeah, you you, sure? you, you no. mentioned something that I think is super important, right? Mm. Because when we talk about you wanting freedom mm. from mental constraints, mm. whether they come through relationship or not. I think it's so important, but you also mentioned your baby girl is 19 now. Yeah. That is so, there are so many years where you're questioning, did I make the right decision? And I, and you know, as black a bunch man, of black breakdowns. man, you already got other traumas. You no, already there were, said There were it. a like, bunch I, of I breakdowns still, where I've called her, called her mother, called my mother, called my father. That's support system. And, and cry, like, hey man, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. And they were like, motherfucker, we told you don't do this shit. And yeah. then I was like, you know what? I'm just to spite you, I'm going to make this shit work. The spite hit harder spite, than McDonald's. Sometimes. sometimes well, sometimes, no, nothing yeah. hits harder than. I've been in fights with big, strong people, and they don't hit harder than McDonald's. Strike. I fought a dude named Egypt. Egypt had one plat in the back of his head, and he bench pressed four or five. And Egypt hit me one time in the chest so hard. Was you locked up with Egypt? Yeah, I didn't want to be. Because that's the only place somebody like him, that exists. I wanted him not to be locked up with me. I think they should have let him go. Or me. One of the other shit that wasn't big enough for both of us. Jesus Christ. But he hit me in the chest really hard, and I'm certain that my heart change rhythms the rhythm that my heart is currently on is the egypt rhythm because before this it was like a <laughs> doom, 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 
doom, doom. Then he hit me. He now it's on a house your, beat. It's like a doom, 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 murmur. Doom. <laughs> he beat you doom, doom, until doom. you had a fucking The fourth heart count murmur. is silent as fuck. You hear me? It's doom, doom, doom. He, he beat you. Doom, doom, doom. <laughs> it's uh, a fucking doom, doom, doom. Beat. But the last, that silent beat, <laughs> it, there's a whisper of Egypt in my, it's like doom, doom, doom. Egypt. You got that dog doom, in doom, it. Doom, doom. Egypt. <laughs> uh, doom, doom. It's crazy. <laughs> this is beyond bars. We knew we'd do bars today. We knew beyond we'd do bars. Yeah. You know what's coming. We knew we'd do beats and bars. Shamir Felonius, but we're in the building. You know what it is. Shout out to Shout out to Shout out to That's his heart. I will say, you know what I do like about, because I know that one of the things old people do, I'm just for the record, I'm 50, fucking, I'll be 52 soon. Lessons, man. One of the things that I want to say about my generation shitting on younger generations, I want my generation to look at the younger generation and say, are you really upset by, about how they're conducting themselves or are you upset that you didn't have the courage to say, this shit's stupid, I'm not doing it? Because there's a lot of, see, they don't understand, they don't appreciate hard work. No one fucking does. We're literally the only species that does this stupid shit. We're the only species in the entirety of nature that goes, I should work 70 hours a week so that I can have the minimum level of shelter and food. And in fact, I could work 40 hours a week plus, but if I only make minimum wage, I still can't afford the minimum shelter and food yeah. by myself. Mm -hmm. We're not that bright. We are convincing ourselves we are. So my generation looks at the young, y'all don't want to work. I don't fucking want to work. Who wants to work? I want to eat. Mm -hmm. So I have to work. No one wants to work. And so the fact that Gen Z has gone, I don't need a seven series BMW. I don't need a six series, you know, the Tesla Model S. They can all kids. I don't need I don't any need of that. Kids. There's I don't need of, kids. Yeah, that seems like a, a bad of. decision if I already don't have money. Like they, they like, well, how, well, if you don't want kids, don't fuck. That's cool. I don't want the my personal relationships to be defined by that. Like Gen mm. Z is so That's cool. They'll interesting. Just delete Snapchat. Boom. They just delete Snapchat. No more dicks. Boom. Boom, there it is. Coming for Kyrie today. Kyrie, I'm sorry, man. You have been locked. You've been incarcerated by our, our rhetoric. Like, this discourse is locked. He's in prison. Up. He's four walls. He's in, that's, a, that's another juke. We'll talk about jutsus later. But, <laughs> but no, I do, I do think that there's, there's a whole bunch of conversation around how we were parented. And there's a woman on, uh, and I want to say her, I want to say it's the one parenting to colonize, but I can't remember. But she has a triangle that's like um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it's the mm. opposite. Uh, it's a it's a triangle that shows how we raise our kids to prepare them for the same status quo that we grew up in. And it basically starts with the way that you are parented. Mm. Right. You parent your kids to be obedient before you parent them to learn things. They have to obey you. Then you take them to whatever your rig religious practice is. And it's a lot of that's based on obedience. Then you send them to school where they learn to sit still and not move and not talk and not do and eat at a certain time and eat at a certain speed and learn at a certain rate. M obedience, walk in a straight line. Because remember, you don't stop walking in a straight line with your friends until you're in middle school and some classes later. Some schools, it's not till high school. Mm -hmm. By that time, you have all these habits established. You're raised, most people are raised to be a particular way. And when you see someone's kid acting outside of that in public, the first thing you go, mm. see, they don't care about them kids. They let them kids run wild. Not, damn, that's a kid acting like a fucking kid. There's a seven-year-old doing seven-year-old shit. You want that seven-year-old to act like he's fucking not there. And that's crazy to, you know, to think of. You've been seven. Mm. When you were seven and somebody was like, sit, sit your ass down. You're like, yeah, damn. I, just, to do I have seven-year-old <laughs> energy. What the fuck am I supposed to do with the seven-year-old energy? You won't let me run around. And now we can't even send the kids outside by themselves because we have to helicopter parent by law, I think is the rule or whatever. My son beat me outside one day by like 10 steps. And I have a, a little vestibule that you go through. He got to the front door while I was still getting into the vestibule. He got outside. It took me maybe five seconds to get there. And by the time I got there, there was a guy, one of my neighbors had his phone out and was about to call because he saw my son outside. Jesus what Christ. the fuck? Unattended. So I can't even let my son fucking go outside in front of the house this and run is, around the circle. They're yeah, like reporting culture. It's so two sided, right? Because there's this, but right. then to your point about like um, the generation really even above you, mm. above us. Like it, I think part of it is like the slight beauty of the like the the converse to the reporting is the mm -hmm. reporting of us to each other via the internet Oof. of like 
this is kind of fucked up, right? Mm. Like actually we don't, I think, mm-hmm. I think for all time, yeah, you're right. People want to, we want to, we want to work to, to feel productive, but we right. don't want to like plug at some machine just so that we can make ends meet two different things. But I think, Oof. I think we, as humans, we might all feel that, but it wasn't until like nineties, early two thousands when, mm-hmm. and now social media, when we could all like look at each other and be like, no, for real, we don't want to do this. And actually you cannot do it. And so now there's just like the blowing out of the water of a generation that like never got to talk to each other like that emotionally let alone technologically but like emotionally didn't get to say this how i feel gen (laughs) x did not have a voice but also gen x was we we came home from school and went home whether someone was there or not there's there's all these jokes about you know why does why does the millennials hate boomers but not gen x why do why do does gen z hate boomers and not because we don't fucking bother people we shut the fuck up most of the time because that's how we were raised you don't let anyone in your house you go home you lock the door you don't let anyone in you don't call anyone you can only use the phone after this time or before this time you don't have a phone in your room a lot of us didn't even have tvs in our room so the communication the the existence we had we thought was ours uniquely until the internet and we went wait everybody did the same shit yeah so I'm not crazy. The early beauty of memes and stuff uh, where you're like, oh, shit, you were get, yeah, experiencing the same thing. Everybody, get, it's, it's the thing, even with TikTok, where you're seeing the Gen X people respond to that. They're all responding the same way. Yeah, yeah, you don't want that. You don't want to fuck with Gen X. We don't give a shit. We fight people. We don't have any safe spaces. We didn't get trophies. We didn't get all of that's true. We might yeah. look at it and go, I like that you get it, but I'm not the person to run up on. That's all I'm saying. I still shoot people like it, it's. I still shoot people. Oh, I do. I, my wife and I have had this discussion that I'm willing to go back. Oh, shit. To protect. Okay. You know, I'm not just That's outside. your inalienable yeah, rights, though, to protect. Outside. Self protection. Yeah, it's an alienable than a motherfucker after you have a felony. They'll tell you you can't have a gun. That's what they say. I, I ain't saying I have one. Don't come to my house. I don't have one. But. Did you say we ain't got legal, right? to do. <laughs> I'm just saying, if oh, wait, something on, were to happen, I, hate, I just got a lawyer this week, so I know how to make one. No, um, <laughs> it's it's fine. But that's actually it's a good um, segue because I think like with Gen X, as we talk about that, um, do we, do we need a break for a second? Um, we're with, selling drugs here, <laughs> but I'm the Batman, so I'm gonna let okay. them sell them. Harry's re-downloading gonna... Snapchat. <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can see him. God, um, I, I wow, dog. I'm not gonna be. The allegation. Can we uh, block it from your phone? Is that something I can do? <laughs> is that an iPhone? Yes, yeah, iPhone. I'm, I'm just. Is I, that a 16? You got the 16 early? No. I, wow. I don't, they I'm sent really you the 16 early. Yeah, I promise. Um, um, my so my <laughs> question was going to be, we can pull this off you. My um, question was going to be like, obviously as Gen X, you know, um, I think a lot of, and you are incredibly wise, by the way. I mean, it's one of the more insightful conversations and and fun and all of that, and to I'll be able cry. to do that. I'm okay with crying. I, I believe that. I can I tell you that. got a hat. Um, I got a. I cry. <laughs> I cry. Shout out to Kev on stage for pointing out the dudes <laughs> who wear these hats with the glasses combo are <laughs> usually poets. I don't do open mics, but. <laughs> The, the glasses and a dangly what earring. No spoken oh, word for you. A septum piercing. You don't have a dangly earring, though, do you? No. Yeah, so you... you s- but Catherine, uh-huh. you speak with the cadence of mm. an artist. Have you ever ombre your nails? All right, I'm going to stop. I think you can what see is? Yeah, right now. You can see my nails. I am on that path. Yeah. I see with my third eye your 13 reasons why. My, my. 13 reasons. There's my Cajun fish fry. <laughs> All right. And we stay high. And we okay. stay high. <laughs> oh, no. Baller. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Bars. 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 Here we are bars. again. Beyond bars. Beyond Ladies and gentlemen, we're back. Boop, 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 boop. No. Uh, now, now that's point, what they call bars. The point, the point of my question with that was, yes. Oh, my God. Sorry. Um, uh, oh, that obviously degree of your wisdom comes from maturity and age, but you know, you're talking about releasing yourself from that prison and everything. It all comes from trauma. It sounds, yeah, of course, <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as does most maturity and wisdom. It's most thing, yeah, the best thing in life. That, I think you said this, but do you, was the moment for you actually being incarcerated and then leave it like, I'm curious if you know and you recognize the moment that you maybe made a change like because you went from yeah. running from the cops like you said taking them over state lines and yeah. then at what 
point, I'm just curious to know how that story unfolded. Comedy. Um, God, I hate that I'm going to say this because I say, know I know you're going to say it too because I'll be saying it. Comedy absolutely saved my life. I say it all the time. Um, Real talk. They now I've them. told I've told parts of this story before, but in 2010. Uh, and in January of 2010, literally like January 2nd, I think, um, I got arrested again. And um, the, 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 when they searched the car, they found a gun under the passenger seat. I am a convicted felon, so just the possession, the mere possession of a weapon, whether I'm using it or whatever, is an automatic five years. And so for that whole year, I was fighting that case. And I it was the worst year that I can recall of my life because I am trying, my daughter's alive. I have a child that I'm a half, I gotta leave now for five years. And she doesn't even know that I'm doing shit that could get me in jail. So now her entire image of me is about to be crushed. The woman that I'm dating is, this is about to be over. Like there's so many things that are falling apart. My entire life is falling apart because of this one charge. And in the process, I became a very angry, um, but funny person, right? Like this, I'm roasting the world and people are laughing, but I'm not trying to specifically be funny. I want you to be mad a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, fuck it, if you get mad enough to fight, because then I can take some of this animosity out on you and blame you for being sensitive about the jokes. And so a buddy of mine, it's a um, high level of self-awareness, by the way. And I was very aware of that at the time. Yeah. I had a friend say, yo, man, you like you're trying to start fights. I said, I am, because if I start it, then everybody's be like, yo, you're an asshole. But if I start joking you and you get mad and want to fight, then... You know, and we know as comedians because we... You know we, what you the know, line is. Yeah. We know yeah. what the line is. So I remember uh, a buddy of mine, um, rest in peace, um, sleep, mm, told me one day, he said, dude, you are hilarious you got to get on stage and I was like that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life if people laugh at me I might slap the shit out of them I don't think that I'm wired in a way that people can look at me that way I don't know that I'm gonna be okay with that mm. and he was like dude you gotta you gotta try I'm like I'm not, I don't have to do shit somewhere in between him saying that and me going to the open mic I got some information from an attorney that said there's a chance that you could beat this case and I was like, yeah, that sounds fucking crazy. Like, I, it, I'm i going to jail. I know I'm going to jail. I'm not going to get my hopes up to get fucking crushed, lose the case, and be disappointed. That sounds dumb. So fuck you. I'm not going to beat the case, but whatever. But I went to see him at an open mic, and he had an okay set, but I remember watching him going, that looks like fun, actually. Like, I'd seen comedy before, but I'd never seen me. You know, you know how when you're watching porn and you replace the dude <laughs> with yourself? You put your dick in the porn. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, POV. Um, POV. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that they had a name for it. But I'm glad you are a, I should know. Um, a sex sommelier here. <laughs> He's like, that's a POV. That's what you're talking about. Um, but Fuck. seeing him on stage made me feel very much like I could do it. And so I, I went back to next week and I signed up. And and the truth is, I walked on stage and knew that I wasn't going to jail. And I don't know how to explain that to you. There was like no, not, no bird that was like, hey, my lawyer didn't call. But when I got on stage, I was like, oh, there's, an, there's another thing. I'm supposed to do this. And since I'm supposed to do this, there's no possible way that I could be going to jail because this is where I'm supposed to be. I found mm -hmm. it. And two months later, I beat the case. Literally the next day, my first the first video that I ever had go viral went viral. It was like it went on world, like literally the next day. And I know it was the next day because I was so worn out from court that I slept until like three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, Cause the emotional toil is yeah. more than, so at three o'clock in the afternoon, I get a call from one of my best friends and it's like, what the fuck are you doing? Just leave me alone. Cause he called like three times back to back. I'm like, what man? He's like, dog, go on Twitter. I was like, that's the dumbest thing. If you ever fucking call me to wake me up to tell me to go on Twitter, I will find you. And I'll beat the shit out. You're like, what the fuck is wrong with you, right? He was like, dog, now nah, your video is blowing up. I was like, I don't fucking care about my video blowing up. I'm asleep. He was like, you're not hearing me. Your video's doing numbers. So I go on, it's like 40,000, 50,000. I'd never had a video go more than eight, 900. So this is huge at the time, right? And from that point it's on. It's still huge, by the way. It's just it's major still huge. At it's, that right. Time. At that time, yeah. especially because I had been doing YouTube videos for two weeks. So like this is maybe my second video. 
That's crazy. And it's already done like 40,000. What the fuck is happening? And so I kept doing them, um, doing videos. And within 11 months, I was on um, WPIX 11 in New York. I was doing commentary for them. They were paying me a fair amount of enough money to live in New York City. And I could just do stand up around the city. This is 11 months into stand up. Mm. When I say stand up saved my life, it kept me out of prison. It refocused my attention because I had been in and out of the drug game pretty much since I was 16, 17 years old. I had oh, never right. gone a decade without selling drugs. And that's even after prison. Like I still would dabble or a little bit here, a little bit there, a whole lot there until I started doing stand up. I've not committed a crime since I started doing stand up other than speeding. I've sp I've sped. I've ha I have sped. Okay, look at me, officer. You didn't catch me. Your bad. Fast. Uh, you gotta, you gotta get to those Iowa shows though, that are seventy two dollars out of two hundred. Seventy. And, and also, I was yeah. driving yeah. an electric. Three times that <laughs> you knew it was there. Hi yo. No. Um. Actually, Teehees. Shout out to Teehees. They paid me fairly. I'd like to see you guys again. Shout out um, Teehees. Great call. Shout out to y'all. Book me. But they. But the 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 crazy part is. From 2000, I started December 19th, 2010. By November 19th, 2011, which happens to be my daughter's uh, birthday, November 19th, 2011, I was on WPIX. Um, a year and a half later, or a little less, I was in Chicago. Less than a year from that, I met my wife. Mm. Another year after that, I'm on um, the nightly show with Larry Wilmore. Well, I love your and stuff on that. And then that summer, I get married. The next summer, my son is born. That year, I do a play with the Second City that ends up being like the most the highest selling t uh, uh, show in D.C. at the Woolly Mammoth Theater's history. The next year, I came back and did an autobiographical show um, produced by Second City, but owned by me, which is almost unheard of at Second City at the time. That was nominated. That got me nominated as a um, travel or touring playwright. So I've, I've been nominated for for stage stuff i've been on shows nominated for emmys all of this because my friend said you're funny you should go on stage so i walked on stage and immediately it clicked that this was the thing and i wasn't funny i, I need to be clear i was not funny that night i don't i didn't bomb because i don't think this was like that kind of space it was a mixed open mic people were rapping and singing and so they didn't boo you if you weren't funny they just kind of went okay you should probably do, what do you usually do? Sell drugs? You should sell more drugs. You know, it was like kind of that feeling, but I knew I knew I was doing a thing that I was going to figure out. Like, I didn't feel like I'll never get this. I felt like, ooh, when I get this. Yeah. That's your ass, Mr. Pope. Like, I mm -hmm. knew. And so you fast forward to that that night with Roy in a theater and a bunch of people cheering and my daughter getting it and my wife getting it, and my son getting it, and this is all on the heels of me just having like a shit ton of fun in DC where like 600 plus tickets were sold to see me on a New Year's Eve weekend. And, right, like I'm like, I'm terrified to go do this because who the fuck is coming to see me on New Year's Eve weekend when you're in DC? You could go see the fucking, the big dick. You know, they got the big dick in the middle of the mall. You know, um, they could go to any of the museums. There are a bunch of parties. What's that called, Kyrie? Um, the White House? <laughs> no, that's where the big dick lives. I'm talking to, It's the Washington Monument. He knows. <laughs> Hi, yo. Okay. All right. Uh, what is happening? Uh, We're having a good time. We're having fun. I don't We're know where, what are you time. doing. Um, no, so, but that's such a... I mean, thank yes, you for comedy sharing Comedy saved my, that. my real life. And it's so, like... It's so special and also amazing and congratulations that you have had those moments and especially this most recent one that you by the way deserve i know that it's important to stay humble in comedy and mm -hmm. you get humbled every day even if you <laughs> decide not to stay humble i'll bomb tomorrow but likely like it's one of yeah, those it's it, like you he say that and it can still be funny his yes. bombs still be good but, <laughs> but that's, that's important <laughs> but it's important of course yeah your bombs got to be fewer and fewer and fewer far between and and hurt less and less but also like they never hurt less if they you never. want to continue excelling they, they never make so those wins better. are so important to have the moments where 
your daughter sees it, where you see it, where you feel it. And I do think that's a testament to your own, by the way, discipline and perseverance, mm. like, and choices thank you to for continue. That, this has been a rough week. <laughs> it's for all, I mean, it's thank you for shit. your conversation. I needed it too. Yeah, I, we're, I was doing a whole it's mess today. I was like, I'm, it's yeah, the I was like, am I no, done? But, yeah, no, dog, this is, this <laughs> is even bigger than that, bro. It's the, it's the but, eclipse and Mercury is in power aid. Both things happening at the same ooh, time. Your tech ooh, is off. Your, don't travel. Mm. You don't look well if you're looking to the eclipse. If you what want if they to, don't have an eye, don't be an ableist. Don't be a don't be an ableist. Turn your head toward the motherfucker. I don't care <laughs> if you dumb enough to look at the eclipse. Do the shit, okay? That's what I'm saying. But yeah. but do your shadow work with Kyrie. Do your shadow work with Kyrie's dick up. Um, no, so wait, no on a on a more real because. So wait, one more. Okay, let me say one more thing about that, which is I think by the way that it is a testament that you are doing your thing and what's mm. right for you and i think not that any stand-up needs any fucking advice from me but i see a lot of when people are spiraling and struggling and it's one of the things that i do think whether it's eclipse or otherwise like whether you do mm. yoga or or just meditate or whether you just spend some fucking time alone with yourself that you mm. actually look in and reflect and say like the second you got on the mic you're like oh this is for me mm, right. like sometimes people are trying to push a rock up a mountain that's not for them and so it's always going to feel like that struggle and it's it's a hard thing to like navigate i think like what is my mountain what is what is the hill that like there's another side and by to? the way that changes sometimes right to- 100%, and, and you don't always yeah. know, that's the that's hard like to writing, recognize your sometimes right, your standard, right that's yeah. What do I focus on There were things right when now? I first started doing it that I was like, I, I don't want to do that. That doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. And then later on in my career, not only did it make sense, but I had prepped myself for it by doing these other things. Totally. If someone had offered it's like trust, me. trust, what it is. It's, yeah. it's exactly. Yeah. If someone had offered me the Daily Show, because the Nightly Show didn't exist at the time. If someone had offered me the Daily Show in 2011 when I first started to do YouTube videos that started to do well, I wouldn't have been prepared. I'd never read from a prompter. I'd never done a desk piece. I'd never had, I didn't know which camera to look. But from 2011 until 2015, I was on either WPIX or Touch Vision or some news program where daily I read from a uh, teleprompter and I learned how to read my own words at a particular cadence that sounded natural. I learned how to read the prompter without my eyes floating back and forth so you couldn't see that I was reading. Like these were skills that I needed in addition to becoming funnier learning where the joke landed, even on paper, the joke, you can read a joke and it's funny, but when you say it, is it gonna sound the same way? Or are you gonna hit the punch at the right part? Or are you gonna use the right inflection? So I had four years of training that I didn't realize were training. The reason that's important is the first time I was on the nightly show, I got a call at 12.30, I was at my desk in Chicago working, and the guy said, can you be in New York by five? And I was like, that's a long ass drive, dog. And he was like, no, we're going to fly you out. But I just want to know, can you get to the airport in an hour? Because your flight would leave in an hour and a half. And I was like, hold on. And I let my manager call my wife, you know, hey, dog, mm, <laughs> mm, dip set. And I got to the plane. I got to New York. But because of traffic, by the time I got to this to the studio, they had already started the show. So I was handed a script and told I had seven minutes to get hair and makeup done, do a couple of passes on. The script so that I could, you're not memorizing it, but you want to be familiar with it so that you don't see so a word you know go when to do certain things. Wait, is that right? But here's the problem the idea of the script was that I was an academic who used unnecessarily large words Damn. to get my point across. So I wouldn't say I got arrested by a police officer, I would say, and the constabulary came in, but I don't use that language regularly. So imagine going on stage unprepped <sighs> off of an airplane. You started this morning. Like drop some SAT words on us. And you give me a shit ton Stat. of SAT words. Boom, 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 boom. Very funny script. We got it in one take. And I remember walking. The guy said, dude, you fucking killed it. And I was like, oh, thank you. He was like, no, you. And it hit me from November of 2011 until that day I had prepped for that role. I didn't know that's what I was prepping for. Mm. If you had asked me to do it in 2011, I would have said I don't want to but I also wasn't prepared for it. 2015, I was not only prepared for it, but I was ready. I'd also been offered uh, audition for this show, audition for that show. I was like, I don't fucking want to do that. It sounds terrible. And then I started doing stage stuff with Second City. So when 2019 rolls around and I auditioned to play a Muslim inmate on a TV show. And I love that role. I'm like, well, that that feels very easy for me. (laughs) 
as a Muslim it's who was you. a former in, it's for it's me. It's for you. And I walk on the show. I was supposed to be in one episode. We went, um, my manager, uh, shout out to Brooke. We're talking about Four Life. We're talking about Four Life on ABC. You can still catch it on Hulu. Uh, but Brooke said to me, hey, it would probably make sense for you to fly out early and do the table read. She said, I know it's going to cost you. You're going to have to pay out of your pocket to do that. But I think if they see you with the table read, it might turn into something more than one episode. And and I'm usually one of those, like, I'm not fucking paying money for a, it might happen. That sounds, I have a child. I have two children. I have a child that's about to go to college. Losing money for opportunity. Losing money for an opportunity. But I, was, I said, something feels different about this. I'm going to take you. I flew out. I did the table read. The next day I was supposed to fly home, and I got a call that said, hey, can you push your flight back? They want to do a producer session with you. So it was me, the producer, and the lead. Um, oh yeah, that, that's smooth, brother. Yeah, Nicholas Pinnock, who also talks like this, but no one no knows. No way, that. man. Yeah, he's he's an in it. He's an in it. In it. Yeah, he's an in it. Not a. He's an in it. Not a ain't it. You know what I mean? He's an in it. Not a ain't it. This is we will talk. But I remember in that session, he and I just had like this really cool, like we'd known each other for a long time type of chemistry. And I was like, that was really fun, man. We talked after. I was like, hey, man, who's your who's your football team? Because I could tell you still got a little bit of oi, 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 oi in you, you know. <laughs> He's like, oh, I like Chelsea. And I was like, mm, never mind, we're not friends. Frank and Bean. Yeah, you, you like beans for breakfast, don't you, dog? Um, a little tea and crumpet face, boy. And Across the pond, ass boy. Before I got, before I left, he said to the producer, so he's part of the world. I, I can see him already in... I, I know what he needs to do in the riot scene. I didn't know what the fuck the riot scene was because I'd only seen the script for the episode I was in. Nice. The riot scene was like seven episodes later and 50 Cent's already on the show by this point. Like there's so much that's happening in this world that I don't know anything about. So I went from one episode to uh, 10. I ended up doing 10 episodes of the show because again, I walked into a thing that if you had asked me a year ago, I would have said no to. So I say that to say, Push your own rock up, but every now and then you'll get halfway up and you'll go, ooh, that is also my rock. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. I still do stand-up. I'll never stop doing stand-up. Faces on the side of Laugh Factory. Right. You can, you well, can that's leave because your... I have a very good face, Kyrie. Yeah. If, 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 let's talk about it. It's less about my talent and more about the fact that there aren't a lot of beautiful black men on earth, and I happen to be one of the nine. So <laughs> you're welcome. Very humble. Very humble. <laughs> Mm. But I, I want to so, riff but, on it. I want to riff on you, it. It's not my some, space, not my said, time. It's like, not for was, me. I'm going to be quiet, is. but you said something I have that thoughts. I think that is is big because uh, a lot of people don't know this about you. Felonius has been a, a, a solid OG in Chicago. Like, in a sense of, like, even when I was still sucking and bombing in, like, 2016, 2017, around the scene when I met him, he was still showing love. And he was still like, uh, oh, because I used to bomb. That that pisses me off about comics who don't bomb, and they talk to young up and coming comics like, ah, you suck. You used to suck, dog. Yes, but you everyone see, but that bo- amount of, of of self awareness, right? Yeah. And the things that you're putting out, all while we're going through those self tribulations, yeah. right? You you got your own stuff going on at home. You right. can easily come in there and, and, and be a dickhead and say, I'm not talking to nobody. Yeah. Don't talk to me, you open micer. Uh, fuck you. <laughs> Look at your shoes. Like you. <laughs> It was so many things you could have did, but I'm already like falling apart because I'm choosing to give my life to comedy. Dumbass decision and, that you made. And terrible you, decision. To, yeah. to be so nice while I figure it out, right, is, is is a testament to your soul. Truly. And for yeah. other people who their thing that's going to save their life isn't comedy. They, I really want to tell less... a joke right now because my my no I, I, because it. my my ego is so uncomfortable in this space. I hear it's you, so but you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable while we big you up because but receiving what you, you need, have to yeah. take your flowers real quick, real quick. Yeah, no, because I'm going to die. <laughs> it ain't going to be that. Jesus it's like Christ. not 30, to, you know, okay. Yeah, we but it could but be no, any Let me just say now. this because <laughs> it's so important for people, right? Because what you mentioned was the ability to not just find comedy. That's the shell. Community. Mm. Purpose. A lot of the things that you talked about, synchronicity. What is your spiritual purpose for being? Where, where do you do where you feel alive? And so for a person who is <laughs> looking for that, they, they, their sign might not be their friend saying, go do an open mic. Their sign might be, mm-hmm. say, hey, go do this business. Hey, go back to school. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, get Cook. this cert. Yeah. Hey, go and do this thing, Cook, you know? Build. So yeah. what, no, what, what, what did you prepare choice. your mind? That was an active choice, though, to, to mm-hmm. be an OG of sorts in the scene because I started comedy so late. I was like, I was a full-grown adult 
when I got on stage the first time. Like I was in my late 30s. But I still felt like a kid because everybody who was my age had already been in stand up for 10, 15 years. So my peers in that sense, the people who I would probably hang around with outside of comedy were already successful or at whatever age wise. Right. But the but the people who were trying to get there were much younger. And the way the social hierarchies are, I'm supposed to talk shit to you little young motherfuckers. But the reality is we are on the same level comedically with this one caveat because very early on in my career I had like a pop on YouTube I already had a certain amount of notoriety even if it wasn't fame Mm -hmm. people knew who I was even if I wasn't funny to keep you from having to navigate that and to have and I'm remembering how shitty older comics were to me when I first started Mm -hmm. I remember actively going hey man you don't have to roast like I wasn't talking to anybody it was just like an internal hey man you don't have to roast the other comics you don't enjoy that you don't enjoy it when people see you and the first thing they do is let me find something to pick on. What do you need? What did you need when you first started doing comedy? Mm. So when a comic comes up to me, I'm assuming that they're coming to me because they respect the work that I do. They respect the way that I present material. They, they see something in me that they are like, I believe you can help me. So if I respond to that by going, shut your ugly ass up, your old big face did it. <sighs> That, what, that doesn't help me or them. Now I feel like an asshole and they're like, I won't ask that motherfucker shit else. Mm-hmm. Conversely, you walk up, you're like, hey, OG, uh, da 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 da. I like, yeah, man, hey, look, just keep going. You know what I remember about you? You do this thing on stage where you boop, 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 boop. Keep doing that and see if you can add this to it. And then one day you will be fucking big, rich, famous, and I'll be like, hey, man, if you don't put me in your movie, I'm going to tell everybody about your Snapchat dick pics. <laughs> Say it again. And boom. All this <laughs> lost footage. I've been recording, dog. <laughs> That's your ass, Mr. Postman. Yeah. Yeah. Bang, bang, bang. That's what you want. You want to Snapchat your dick, huh? <laughs> yeah, you put the bunny ear filter on it, huh? Okay. Yeah. That is sick. What made the tongue come out? That's what I want to know. How'd you get the tongue come out on your dick pic? That's gross. You pervert. That's what I want. <laughs> but we're not going to do that because you're going to put me in your movie. And we'll have to worry about that. This is real. This True is real. story, though. I remember <laughs> Skylar Higley, who's one of my favorite young comics. He's um, funny as hell. Yep. Very funny. Fantastic pen. He's one of my favorite writers. But off, off stage, he's also a really good dude. But I wouldn't have known that because when we first met, I used to roast the shit out of him. No reason. He'd never done anything to me. Um... There was nothing in particular that I was roasting. He, I didn't dislike him. I just, that's how I responded to people that were mm-hmm. new. And then I remember one day he said something and I said, that's good, man. That was a, a good set. And I saw him brace like he was waiting for me to fry him. And I was like, that's all, man. You, I know you waiting for me to say some fucked up shit. I'm not going to say some fucked up shit. You, that was a really good set. And he, like, you could see him relax. And I went. Oh, that's how I make people feel? Yeah, bro. Well, that older black sucks. Man. Oh, no, older black man, yeah. you have the ability to build. Right, but but it sucks when people flinch when you come around because they think they have so. to prepare. Because they also still like you. So they're going to accept a little bit of the abuse so that they can stay in proximity with you because they respect you and they like a thing that you do. Mm-hmm. That sucks. So if you like me, I shouldn't take advantage of that by shitting on you to see how much shit you can t- I wouldn't do that to my wife. Mm. Oh, you love me. Let me talk shit to you because you know I love. That's you're gonna fucked take up because you're going to take it. Mm. That's not a good person. I don't care how much people will allow you to do. You choosing to do it is on you. Say that again. And so, yeah, that was that was the thing with the young comics. I remember that. I remember it was Skyler and he did. I don't even know if he knows it, but I remember thinking this kid's going to be a great fucking comic. How do I want him to remember me? But that's a big thing. And, and so it's been a, like that with the rest of the young a, comics. That takes a, a level. Except for Jarrell so. Barnes. I still give Jarrell Barnes shit because fuck him. I'm kidding, Jarrell. I love you. Ah! I'm sorry. He, he's Jarell, he's not even here. He's you know wild? As I was thinking about Jarrell earlier when you were talking about using the extra language yeah, or whatever yeah. they wanted you to do. And I think Jarrell always says something about like the most simple way is actually yes. the most elegant way. Like, Absolutely. I, should, I mean, Jarrell, he's such a fantastic comic. He's got that, a great pen too. Yeah. yeah and man, for that, but for that to be his like, I think his little like byline is just perfect. It's it's, just say it. It's <laughs> one of those things that new comics, if if there's anything you could drill in a new comic's head, is say it with the least amount of words. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. me, I could cut Less half more. my set. <laughs> well, the crazy part is you get your first hour and then you take it out and you realize it's really 32 minutes. 
because there's a bunch of extra unnecessary shit in there. You got a if you have an hour, if it's your first one, you probably have a really good thirty minutes. I think God. that's true. For, yeah, for so many, and I don't <laughs> you know, know I don't know what the threshold or what that turnover is, but yeah, every. I don't know if it's every one of us and all the time, but yeah, I totally agree, especially in the first like four mm -hmm. or five years and oh, myself yeah. included, but I'll see comics like recording stuff with like, here's my whole 30. I was like, oh, tight 15. It's a tight, it's a strong, a tight, it's a strong 18, like, baby girl. And I say that for myself <laughs> too, three. knowing like you can always cut, cut, cut. There are but. versions of jokes that I've been doing for six or seven years that you can't recognize as the same. I know it's the same joke because I know how I got yeah. here, but. If you saw the early version, I have jokes that are now like 45 seconds that used to be five minutes. I get the mm. exact the same craft. amount of laughter out of the 45 seconds that I used to get out of the five yeah. minutes. It's going to the earlier point about my bomb now was not my bomb then. Um, Neil Brennan, I remember saying to me one Great day. Great fucking writer, man. Name drop. Uh, <laughs> Neil, <laughs> Neil Brennan, we, we I remember We accept him. it here. I was listening to Blocks on the Way Up. We <laughs> accept that drop here. Yeah. He, uh, he, I remember him telling me one day that you know you're getting better when what you would call killing is now what you call bombing. Yep. And I remember <laughs> being at the Laugh Factory last summer and having what a, a fucking miserable, for me, set. I was just like, I walked off stage like head down. And one of my friends was there, he was like, yo, what's, what's going on? What's wrong? And I was like, I fucking, I just, I don't think I was like fully present. I wasn't listening to the audience. I wasn't taking the feedback right. Like I was rushing to get to the next joke because I didn't hear the laugh I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I was da da da. And they were like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like I recorded, listen to this. And they're watching, they were like, laugh, laugh, laugh. And I'm like, yeah, but it should have been louder laugh, louder laugh, louder laugh. God, comedians are crazy. But if I compare that 10 minute set to a 10 minute set from two years ago, not 10, just two years ago, I got more laughs on this set that I was miserable about than the one two years ago that I posted every fucking where because I thought I was killing. So but also, thank God, right? Like the right, two-year turnover. Right. Like, and people that stay the same is like, that, oh. that's where you worry. Is oh, like, well, that's the same. Actually, that's the same laughs <laughs> that you were getting two years ago. Like, that's, that's the fear. And it's crazy <laughs> for comics because, like I said, sometimes it's not a big shift in a joke. It's something small. It's a, it's a one line that changes how the joke goes. It's a, I have a joke about... Um, <laughs> gluten that I really enjoyed telling but I the way I started telling that joke when I first started telling the joke is not close to how the, the punchline isn't even the same anymore the end the gluten line was added by Calvin Evans shout out to Calvin mm, um the in 27 crazy right now <laughs> you know how I do <laughs> I know everybody um but shout out to Calvin he he said hey man the joke is so heavy and so serious you have to end it with something sillier Sounds That's like that joke advice. might be about yeah, absolutely. me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're like, wait, is this about this person? I heard, but, I heard gluten, and I just immediately got triggered because actually mm, I can't even discuss it in conversation, let alone targeted. have it in the same room. Oh, speaking of triggers, I've been working on glimmers. Are you, you're familiar with glimmers? I'm not. Glimmers what? are a trigger is something that that makes you go back to a trauma yeah. or a, a glimmer is something that makes you go to a happier place it has the opposite impact on you and because oh. we are so much we've been we've taught ourselves to recognize our triggers to protect ourselves but we don't teach ourselves to recognize our glimmers to to look for right oh. so it's just like if you're dieting and you're just taking stuff out of your out of your diet and things that you can't eat but you haven't put things into your diet that you can at some point, you're going to be malnourished. Sure, you don't eat the bullshit that gives you inflammation, but you also don't eat anything that gives you any nutrients. Mm. When we are cutting all of our that triggers response. out. <laughs> the Yoda? She was like, mm. Mm. <clears throat> more say, please. Mm. <laughs> I don't want. But, but that's the, that's the <laughs> thing. Like, I'm so I remember, sorry to interrupt such a beautiful No, but that's, no I, I appreciate that so much because I get really uncomfortable when I say <laughs> anything that makes sense belly for in the two corner. more. Mm. Mm. More food. <laughs> Snap checks, ah, beans and franks, mm, franken beans, ah, vitamins and minerals, <laughs> cucumba. Um, <laughs> but I, I've been doing that like actively recently, like literally looking for. Oh, every time I do that, it makes me feel good. Every time I do that, it makes me feel good. And not only does it make me feel good, but it pushes me to do right because a trigger doesn't just make you feel bad; it can start a spiral. 
I know all of the things that start my spirals. I know how to spiral into anxiety. All I have to do is start thinking about what's going to happen two weeks from now that I can't fucking control today. There's nothing I can do about it today to impact it for two weeks from now. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about it every day from now until two weeks. So I'm going to be miserable until the day it happens. And I'm probably going to be miserable again because it's going to suck. Or glimmers. You know that's going to be over that day. That's going to be the end of it. And you won't have to think about it anymore. What a fucking relief that's going to be. You that's going to be amazing. Like, oh, man, you see how that took so just good. the, the, the yeah. feeling of, and so now I'm living in the, hmm, it's going to feel really good when that's over with. It's going to feel really good when I'm past that. And all of the stuff that I get to do in the meantime, between time, I get to still hang out with my kid and have fun. My wife and I are going to watch this show tonight. Ooh, there's a new episode of Invincibles on. Like there's all the of these things. things that I get to enjoy that I wasn't able to enjoy before because I was so wrapped up in avoiding my triggers and searching for my tri And now I'm searching for my glimmers and I keep fucking finding them. And I'm like, yo, there's so many things that make me happy. I get to go on stage and say jokes and I know how this joke is going to work. And ooh, I got a new joke about abortion that's really weird. But also, it's been hitting. It works. I've got this one joke that, and and that makes me. Ha I got a new thing I wrote. I got a new sketch that I can do. I've got a new microphone for my. All of the I could go do Kyrie and Catherine's podcast. That's a new thing, and I get to talk about prison, which is something I'm fucking passionate about because. Not only am I an abolitionist, but I also like want to help people who have been incarcerated and are now free become people again because the mm. world doesn't want you to be. I have mm. my right to vote back. I don't know how helpful it is this time, but like those things matter to me that, that the things that make you a citizen belong to me. Whether I choose to use them or not, people who have the right to get a gun doesn't mean you're gonna get a gun. So having the right to vote doesn't mean that you have to vote. I hope you do something, but my point is that getting your ID or your driver's license or your social security card when you first come home makes you feel like you're back. Mm -hmm. But well, that's just glimmer. the first step. There was a glimmer, and then you do the next step. I got my first job, glimmer. I had my first date, glimmer. I had my first this, glimmer. Like There's that. parts of Chicago that I go to, and I'm like, ooh, my wife and I went there on our first date, glimmer. I like that. that. Right, like all of these little things that trigger happy thoughts. They tri trigger good feelings. They release the endorphins that you want. I was in the gym the other day. I got a terrible phone call. It was like, hey, man, you owe fucking twenty thousand dollars for this thing and i was like nah that's bullshit so i tried to reach out to an attorney they were like nah you owe that and i was like motherfucker <sighs> it's gonna feel crazy when i pay that motherfucker off and went back to benching <laughs> that's so and i came home my wife was like how the fuck did you avoid i was like this is what i did these are the steps i took and so not only am i not spiraling down I'm spiraling i'm up. spiraling up i just wrote some cool shit i'm gonna do a new joke this weekend i got a Oh, Roy Wood Jr. reached out afterwards and was like, hey, you want to do my June shows in, in Chicago? I'm like, fuck yeah, I do, because I'm going to need that shit. to pay all that money. But you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, look, imagine if I just sat there sad and then got that call. It would have helped a little, but I still would have been sad and it would have been like, mm, not enough. Versus, it's going to work out. Then I get that call and I'm like, see, shit's already in my favor. There's This isn't a power of positive thinking thing. You can't do that. You, you can't positive think yourself out of poverty or positively think yourself out of pain. Or, but what you can do in those neutral moments, because there's a bunch of moments that aren't positive, they aren't negative, they're just neutral moments and whatever we sit in. I used to tell people, because I thought I was like uh, really good with words, I would say, whatever you dwell on is what you dwell in. And I thought that was like the deepest thing I'd ever heard, mostly because I'm arrogant. But I still, <laughs> I still believe it to be true, whether or not it's deep, right? Whatever you focus on, that's the world you've created for yourself. And if you constantly are thinking about every bad thing, every traumatic thing, you're gonna live in your trauma. Oh. So you have to find a way to, if it's one thing a day, I'm gonna do this one good thing. Every morning when I wake up, I'm gonna do this one good thing. The same way I can scroll Instagram and see a bunch of people that I love, I like the way they look, I'm gonna go look in the mirror and see if I can like me that way. I'm gonna look in the mirror every day and see if there's a thing in that mirror that I can say, I like that about you. And it's hard some days. Some days I look at I'm like, man, you old ass motherfucker, your under eyes, you dead motherfucker. Ernie Hudson look better than you, that motherfucker 80, dog. I don't like that shit, fuck you Ernie Hudson. But, <laughs> but every now and then I'll look and go, hey man, this body has carried you through six years of prison. It avoided a stabbing. The little graze mark doesn't even hurt anymore. I got a scar on my cheek. Nobody can tell but me. That's the kind, That's my skin. My skin has been 
protective, supportive, and regenerative. That's who I am. I still have most of my hair at 55. So you see, you see I'm 52. How, you see how you, you, you see yourself different than like other people yeah and sometimes we fall into a disconnect that that like you said it can lead you spiraling down and so for other people who uh whatever the run-in was with the legal mm -hmm. system uh, or the justice system uh it, it kind of has them it becomes their personality right because that scarlet letter the way the world is viewing mm -hmm. you now they treating you different so now you start to second guess yourself right and so Absolutely. when i was doing cognitive behavioral therapy one of the things i ran into was that i can't when, even say that many syllables cognitive behavioral therapy, therapy right that sounds cool it's as fascinating shit. that i was even certified in peace circle i thought right? cbt was the stuff that you put on your elbow when you got the tendinitis you but thought it was THC without the fun That's CBD, time? ain't it? That's a different thing. C okay, no, I'm but, sorry. <laughs> um, we talk about changing up the people, place, and things yeah. so that they can um, yeah. give themselves a fresh start, right? Because sometimes if I go around comedians and they're like, dick pick Kyrie, I can't outgrow <laughs> my past weekend. <laughs> We're doing glimmers. We're, doing we're not doing triggers. Okay, doing, right. And so, you want to live, so li live in your light or you want to. We're living saying, in your trauma, bro. No matter what other people's glimmers or traumas, we're not yucking people's yums. But. A little bit. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. A little, I'm a little. Mm, ew. Even that. Brother, ew. <laughs> brother, ew. Brother, ew. What is that, brother? Even that ew. analogy, yucking people's yums, is just. That's yuck. Yeah. That's no, yuck. But, yeah. <laughs> What? How do other people switch up some of those people, places, and things that only bring them yeah. triggers versus the glimmers? Right? How do they? How do you? But how it, do you find it that? It starts new in that mirror. Yeah, one thing at a time. It starts mm. in, be yeah. because because the first thing you said was that scarlet leather that was put on them, right? You're a felon. You did. You're not a felon. You didn't wake up a felon. You weren't born a felon. You did, right? Somebody decided that you were guilty of a thing that other people have been guilty of but not convicted of. Why are you different than them? Mm. Right? So you're not a felon. You are a Kyrie. Dick pick Kyrie, non-dick pick Kyrie, you're still a Kyrie, right? I am who I am. I'm not what I've done. Even though a lot, that's because, because we live in a productivity-centered world, most people are what they do. So when you say, who are you? People start telling you the job they have, the clothes they wear, the car they drive, the the school they went to, all of those are things that have nothing to do with you. And I hate to go back to an anime reference, but Gara, who, who full circle, full <laughs> circle, Let's do it. Gaara, the line who anyway. is the, is one of the Jinchuriki, uh, he his insides housed a monster. Literally, they had sealed a monster inside his body, and he had to learn to control the monster. And at some point, they pulled the monster out of him. And in his brain, he got to see himself, a small version of himself. And he was like, wait, is this who I am? This small piece of consciousness. I'm not the monster. I'm not my ninja skills. I'm not my fighting skills. I'm not my, how I'm represented to the rest of my village. This little voice in my head is who I am. And I get to take that voice and make it whatever I want it to be. Mm -hmm. Until you can do that, it's hard to change the, pe the people, places, and things because you know you're judging yourself by how those people see you. Those pe and when I say those people, these are people you care about. These aren't fucking idiot strangers on the internet. This is your mom. This is your dad. It's hard at 38. People that are still in the box. These are people who are still in the box. And, and yeah. in your life. In their and, mental and prison. Yeah. You can't swap them and out. You can't swap them out. You yeah. can't pick another mom. Ooh, it's one of the things shit. they say. You only get one. Well, damn. And that think, seems yeah. fucked up. And because you like a crackhead. It's tough. Especially when you're doing what to them is crackhead shit. My mother literally yeah. told my grandfather, I don't know what the fuck he's doing. I think he went off and joined the circus because I was doing stand up. To her, the not, leap from not stand incorrect. up. Right. To, to her, the leap Damn. from stand up to circus was <laughs> way shorter than the leap from, you know what I mean? Yeah. So to change the people, places, and things, the first thing you have to be able to do is to shut out their voices. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can do that is to focus on yours. And that's hard because from the very first moment you became aware, you became aware of yourself through everyone else's eyes. You're aware of who you are, how you are, and what you are because your mama told you you were this, your daddy told you you were that, your cousin told you you were this, the kids in the neighborhood said you were this way. Mm -hmm. And you either spent most of your life living up to that or fighting against it, but you never stopped and went, wait, who the fuck am I? What do I like? Do I like fried food? Do I like this type of shit? Do I like catfish? Because it's a little wet. I don't want my food wet on the inside of the fried part. That's moist. weird. It's moist. This moist meat is strange. You I like, like moist it. meat? I like juicy, 
but I don't like moist. Not the same thing. You see what I'm saying? That's mushy meat. I don't want no mushy meat. No deal. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with catfish. If you like mushy meat in your mouth, put it in your mouth. But what or, I am or saying sign is, a bad boy. take that. <laughs> That. No, no, like no, 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 no. Meat in your mouth, son, the bad boy. <laughs> Meek Mill got to be forgiven for Ain't what he did with Diddy. Nothing we love to do more on this podcast than get off track. A little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> take the train. Take the train. Don't become a part of one. Um, Not to yuck your yum. But my part. Oh, yeah. Oh, Ew, brother. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> what is that? Ew. <laughs> But but no, it's, it's a hard thing to do. But I promise you, if you get up every morning, look in the mirror, and try to find a thing that you like about you, you have to talk to yourself because it's weird. The first few days, the first few days, you like, hey man, <laughs> you still have all of your teeth. Hey man, <laughs> this is a good skin day for you. You know what I mean? Hey, hey man. That food you cooked last night was good. Hey, man. Small shit. Don't make Million it. Million dollar idea. Sometimes you should too, make affirmations. That, sometimes, yeah. too, it's, hey, man, like, you're trying. Hey, I man, like to you me didn't anyway, give up. Sometimes, like, you hey, didn't man, give up. Hey, you didn't you're give doing up. this today. Hey, man, like, you, you like rolled shit. out of bed. You didn't want to. Yeah. This is all stupid. Like, hey, all man. the earth sucks yeah. right now, and yeah. you keep getting up and trying. That's how badass you are. Because that's a badass thing. Mm -hmm. You know you're not going to win. Think about what I'm saying. I'm yeah. not making that to like shit on people's dreams. I'm telling you that there's really very little you can do today to impact the world globally. And you feel that weight so often that you are drinking or smoking or whatever you're doing to avoid thinking about it. But you got up anyway. You got up anyway and said, fuck it. I, there's something about this world that I need to be a part of. There's something that I contribute. There's a laugh that someone's going to get from me. And I want comics to know that part we are so hard on ourselves. And if you do a show and there's 200 people and only 10 of them laugh, you made 10 people laugh and feel better for a few minutes. We all want to make all 200 fucking laugh. We want to make a stadium full of people laugh. But if you made 10 people laugh today, you made 10 people's day better than it would have been if you weren't there. Fucking give yourself credit for I improved yeah. ten people's lives. You participated. I participated yeah. in the improvement. The, the, and that's that we do so oh, and if you had fucked up and bombed and nobody had laughed, you would have shit on yourself for weeks. You ready to jump off. But you don't give yourself credit for the ten people that laughed. We'd be our own worst enemy, though. Have you ever been paid to do comedy? Yes. Sir. That's fucking amazing. Do you know how many people will never, ever, 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 ever get paid to do the thing that they love? You look in the mirror and be like, hey, man, sometimes people give me money to say the silly shit that happens in my head. You know what's funny? You you say that, and, like, uh, last year I had a, a talk with one of the OGs. Shout out to uh, shout out to her, but Maya uh, out of New York. Mm -hmm. She was telling me, Kyrie, you know, you might actually be a better writer and producer and a mm. comedic actor than stand-up, and mm. I could have fucking cried for five days straight, dog. Mm. And it took me so long to understand what she was telling me. That's not a negative. It, it wasn't, but because it, of our ego. Because you wanted her to say you're a great comic. Ooh. And she and, did. And by the way, she didn't say you weren't. She, and, you know, but it. She it, said you might be better at another thing. And it's the immaturity in our minds because we're so egotistical. Dog, I'm 52. If somebody said that to me right now, I've been like, bitch, eat a dick. How the fuck is you talking to? I'm I nice so on stage. Yeah. I'm mer Oh. <laughs> you said I'm good at something else, and I just heard I'm not good at this. That's Fast forward. That's and I'm me. getting flown out to do uh, like punch ups for social media content mm -hmm. for grocery stores and stuff. Right. And like, one you, of the is it to Dubai? Because no, if you go to like, Dubai, they're going to shit on you. No, no, it's know. Texas. Oh, okay. So mm. shit on you a different way, right? <laughs> 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 but have, no, shout out Snapchat to them. But I told one of the producers. <laughs> oh, shit. That's I told right. one of the They block porn sites out there, yeah, so maybe yeah. you want to stay in Oklahoma. Wait, well, I download them first <laughs> so they're already yeah. my thing. You can download them. It's too quick. It's too quick. Like Spotify playlist. Anywho, I was no, I ain't no any. You can't <laughs> anywho your way out of because that because you because what you Yuck. said is important. I was telling I'm the producer yum. that that one of the things that we have to understand is is one of is the mm -hmm. things we have going on for ourselves. Right, you've been paid to do something. Yes, that people do for free, yes. and someone in another area yes. said, "Hey, can do. can I please fly you here to, to give do you it? more money to do this thing that people you're good?" Go their whole life without getting on a plane, dog. You got to take those little things and understand that you can make something big out of what you got going. It's, and the other thing is we have to stop calling big things little things because someone else has a bigger thing. 
right? That's like I, shit. like uh, oh, you were on a TV show. I was on a TV show. You you were on a TV show for five seasons. I'm still on a fucking TV show for ten episodes. The fuck are you talking about? That's a huge thing. What That's a huge thing. <laughs> I, I did a movie with Michael Shannon. We've had a whole bunch of conversation. I to the extent that sometimes people will ask me for my bio and I forget to put that I was in a movie with Michael Oscar fucking winning Shannon. I forget that that happened. I was in a movie with Suge Avery, with the lady who played the original Suge Avery in The Color Purple. We spent time together in the fucking... St- we have lines together. I, Like, I was in these movies, and I wasn't like, ooh, the camera passed by. I was in the fucking trailer. I forget that shit because I haven't allowed myself to... Um, Pat myself on the back because where I'm from, you don't do that because somebody will rob you if they see you too. Fuck that. Mm. Fuck that. If if something bad happens to me, you get to talk shit about it for the rest of my life, but I don't get to talk shit about the good thing I did. When I was growing up, when I saw people on TV, they were fucking aliens to me. I didn't know them. They didn't. I didn't know anyone who was them. I didn't know how to become them. And now someone... We'll be flipping through the fucking Hulu, scrolling to see what they want to watch. And episode three, there's a big picture of me sitting at a fucking court table like, it's my face. My name is in the fucking credit. You can go to your fucking Roku and put my name in and shows that I've been on will show up. If you had told me five years ago that that was going to be reality, I would have been like, yeah, fuck out of here. That sounds crazy. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's, and so, but I don't get to talk shit about it. I don't get to... To me, I don't even have to go outside and be like, yay, everybody know who I am. But for me, that's easy. I should look in the mirror and go, hey, you movie star motherfucker. Real shit. Hey, man, you were on one of the funniest episodes of Southside. It was such a funny episode that before the season came out, when they did all of the write-ups, everybody who did a write-up, one of the episodes they talked about being one of the best episodes was that episode. And I'm like, oh, shit, they're going to like it. They've seen it. Damn. That I got to be. That's part of history. The laughter episode of Southside, so on HBO Max, I was a part of that. It's fine, it's fine. For life, won a fucking Emmy, won a fucking Emmy as groundbreaking television for activism. I was on that show. But those are things that, like, when I look in the mirror, I was like, hey, man, you, you, did, you didn't tour the country last year. What? No, it's I'm I'm in that's my head. That's crazy. a so there's a, there's a constant. That's the rock that you left That's the rock. I'm like, I left it there You're for like, a minute. Just... Because why am I not touring? Why am I not selling out all over the country? I did a show in Dayton, Kentucky. Literally two shows. The first show, 27 people showed up. The second show, three sold up. I'm talking about tickets sold. 30 total tickets sold in two shows. This is within the last six months. I wanted to quit stand-up. Again, I've quit 37 times in the last two, three years, right? Then I went to D.C. and sold 600 tickets. God, success be not linear at all. Then I went to Iowa. No, I'm sorry. Then I went to fucking um, Monticello, which is, I thought, in Virginia. That's California, right? Nope. No. Apparently, there's one in uh, central Illinois, right outside of fucking where U of I, uh, Champaign-Urbana is. Really? Two shows, both sold out. I was supposed to do three. Cops pulled me over. I ended up being late for the first show because it was a last-minute thing, right? The comic got COVID still because it's still out there, motherfuckers. Comic got COVID. They called last minute. I was able to do the show. Drove down, running late, and only did two shows. They paid me for all three because the second two shows were so good. The next week, I go to Teehees. Two shows sold out. The week after that, Roy and I are on the road together. Two shows sold out in, um, in Minneapolis. The next day, we go to Madison and like 13, 1,400 people, one show. Six months before that, I was in Dayton, Kentucky, in an empty fucking room. It was an old church called The Sanctuary. It's a great club, but I didn't sell tickets there. And I'm thinking, what the fuck can I do to sell tickets? Fast forward, we do this next thing, and everybody's buying tickets. I made, I came home with more money. I made more money in one weekend than you know a lot of people make doing TV shows. And I'm like, the fuck is wrong with me? I was ready to quit. That's what comedy is. So I have to count those wins the same way I fucking drove home from Dayton, Kentucky, miserable in a motherfucker. I should drive home from fucking in, uh, Iowa, happy as <laughs> playing DMX and barking. That's my shit. So find a way to have the same positive conversations, at least spend the same amount of time. Try more. But if you can't spend the same amount of time giving yourself the positive 
reinforcement that you do when you are giving yourself the spiral. You know that voice when you're spiraling, and I would be willing to bet it's not even your voice. That voice telling you that you're not worth it, that you're doing the wrong thing, that you're making the wrong choices, it isn't even your voice. It's the voice of all of the people that raised you and all of the people in your neighborhood and all of the people in society who you've heard who have told you that the decisions you're making are wrong. And every time you are off just a little bit, their voices creep back in. And you've convinced yourself it's you, your own voice. And so you trust that voice. That's a lying motherfucker. He's lying. You're doing the right thing. That voice is wrong. That is impeccably wise and perfect. And honestly, oh. uh, uh, like a, I'd say a bookmark in a conversation that Perfectly we timed. could keep having, having, would want to keep having, but we are time well down. over. We're way over. Um, sometime in this episode. Yeah, but, we did blow the time. Um, so I mean, it's funny you dropped so I'm many, sorry, so many um, knowledgeable just gems in here. Well, obviously, we'd love to have you back. Um, Hell yeah, we need to have you back. Things. We got questions we didn't even get I know, to. We, oh. we this is one of those. Walk people through, but, and uh, you gave it, you gave us a lot without really us having to ask them, to be honest. So yeah, thank you brother, for being here. Um, for plug what you got me. going on, what you got coming up, and then we ask people, too, if you want to drop in like what Ooh. you're what you're listening to. We like to like oh, put like on that. some mm -hmm. bars, so to speak. Bars. Beyond the bars. <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna use that. Going this is felonious monk, and we are going <laughs> beyond the bars. Bars, bars, bars. Bars, 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 bars. Curbing on curbing, my bars on layers, ho. Um, <laughs> Plug your shows. <laughs> <laughs> He probably got like a week of shows. Like is, seventy-two man. shows, <laughs> or whatever you want. Plug. Uh, you want plug. I am doing. I am doing uh, Raleigh. North Carolina, April 23rd. It's a Tuesday. It's an off day. So the only way that they'll give me weekends at some clubs I've never been to is if I show them. I can sell tickets on a day where people have to go to work the next day. For some reason, that makes mm -hmm. sense to them. But Tuesday, April 23rd, I will be at Good Nights Comedy Club in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'll be telling jokes with my good friend, Mr. Mouse Jones, also known as the host of Trap Karaoke. So even if you don't like me, come see the motherfucker from Trap Karaoke. But truthfully, if you don't like me, something's wrong with you. Uh, all April 24th, I'll be at the Virginia Beach Funny Bone. Same thing, me, Mouse Jones, Kiki Keys. You know, it's going to be good, fun. Uh, also, something you should know, that's where I used to sell drugs. Not at the comedy club itself, but like that general area. So if I ever sold you cocaine and you owe me money, show up to the show. Bring me my motherfucking money. Because if I see you just walking around, please don't think this TV and, and movie shit has changed me that much internally. I will open hand slap the fuck out you and take my money from you. So nice. I suggest you bring it to me nicely. April 24th, the Virginia Beach Funny Bone. Mouse Jones is opening up. I got some friends coming out, some family coming out. It's going to be a good time. Um... And June 22nd, Chicago, if you're in the Chicago land area, I'm going to be at the Anatheum. That's uh, how you say it. It's the Anatheum. I don't know why it has a Greek name. I don't even know if it's Greek, but it sounds like it should be with Roy Wood Jr. He is, yeah. uh, I shouldn't say with Roy Wood Jr. I'm, he's the headline. I'm, he let me, don't worry about that. But I'm with <laughs> Roy April, June 22nd and maybe even in St. Louis, June 21st. Who knows? We'll see how that goes. Uh but those are the main ones. Anything else that you see me on, I ain't know about it either until the last minute. My bad. Sometimes I don't even be paying attention. <laughs> Bitch, I'll be outside. And look at all my shows. For Life on um, Hulu. Uh, there's a movie called Block Party. It's on BET Plus, but sometimes it's still on TV, like on BET Her, BET Jazz, whatever those shows are. BET Plus. Uh, if you have Shudder, if you like horror movies, that's the movie that I'm in with Michael Shannon. It's called Night's End. If you have HBO Max, watch me in... Um, uh, Southside on HBO Max. Uh, if you have HBO Max, also I'm on uh, season two of Pause with Sam J. Um, Sam J if you have uh, $75, I will sell you a really good, my bad, that's it. I don't have anything else to plug, but I am the plug. Of Bars. course he is, and that's, that's what it's got in the hey. Bars. On our podcast. We're beyond, <laughs> we're beyond bars. Beyond, beyond our bars. time, Polonius, um, thank you so much. You're truly, like Kyrie said, not just an OG, but um, still someone that we look guys. up to and would love to have back. And I love you guys. You that, guys are great. I think has been our episode today. Thank you. Shout out to Lincoln Lodge for hosting us extra time today. Tyler for uh, running all of our uh, video, audio, editing, and Christian for being here from the Lodge. It's a model spirit. We love you so much. Yes. We Christian are. is my anime Over and friend. Over out. On to the next mountain. Mm.